Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Johnny's Juke Joint on this Friday. I have no idea what the date is, so I'm going to look here. June 25th. Uh, we got started a little late tonight. Sorry for some, uh, we had some technical difficulties. Um, but I'm really excited to uh, chat and learn more about percussion instruments and, and playing percussion and, and uh, the role of the percussionists from one of the best percussionists that I know and have had the pleasure to work with, um, the great Bob Fenske. Bob, you there? Hey, Johnny. Hey, Bob. How are you? I'm great, thanks. How are you? I'm good. You're looking good. You have a you always you have a, you always have colorful clothing. Look at your your shirt is very. Um, what's the word for it? How can we describe your shirt that, to hmm. people who can't see it right now and they're it's just listening? It's summery. It's flowers. It's summery, um. Flowers. You know. Mm -hmm. My zipper. I tried to make my zipper match your shirt. See, it's quite it's uh, a colorful zipper. Is that coming up? You see it? <laughs> I see that. Yes. Are you impressed? Yeah. That's a lot I for am. me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you know, Johnny, like I'm kind of known for my shoes and. Usually True. I would have matching shoes to match my shirt, which I did have on today, but um, uh, it's kind of hot out there right now. So I'm actually barefoot. So, um, uh, mm -hmm. well, good. That was actually my next question. So we're, so we're moving right along, clipping at a fast pace. Um, <laughs> Man, well, okay, I've I've known you a long time, and I got a lot of questions to ask you. I have a lot of questions to ask you, yeah. but right out of the gate, let's start right with square one because I think this is something that uh, that 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 people who aren't uh, musicians who aren't in the band who aren't seeing how we put things together mm -hmm. and how music goes together might not necessarily understand directly what a percussionist is. So. When I say, oh, you know, if I say to someone, what band did you see or where did you go or what did you hear? Uh -huh. Oh, there were two drummers was a lot of the time what I what I hear. And I'm going, well, I don't think there were two mm. drummers. Um, there was probably a drummer and a percussionist or there were two percussionists. Now, of course, you play mm. drums, but it's not the same thing as a drummer, is it? No. No. And so drummers are percussionists. And percussionists are drummers. Yes. But some drummers, oh, I better be careful. <laughs> <laughs> we're already in, uh, in, we're already getting ourselves in trouble. Uh, yeah. Next, we're going to talk about politics and religion. Um, okay, so, uh, so some drum, or dr drummers are percussionists and percussionists mm -hmm. are drummers. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we're even more confused. Exactly. So, <laughs> because all drums are percussion instruments. Right. So, there's many different, um, basically almost anything that uh, you strike or um, almost anything that vibrates. A piano is a percussion instrument, for example. Okay. So, um, so, yes, exactly. And so, drummers play drum sets, drum drummers, um, whereas a percussionist usually depending on which genre of music we're talking about. If we're talking about classical percussion or in the school band, the percussionist is going to play everything from your concert bass drum and your snare drum and your cymbals and your xylophone and marimbas and vibraphones and timpani and... Wow, okay, so we're already, we're yeah. already mentioning, and we've only talked about, say, an orchestral percussionist mm -hmm. uh, in a classical realm or in a, in a concert band setting. And we've already you've already mentioned about seven instruments there that that are that have different names that and and so a bass drum would be you probably don't have one beside you there to show us no so well bass drum no would be um like a big round big big round on drum both sides yeah mm -hmm. and those come from the marching tradition as well Correct. or used in the yes. marching like you know the you see them and uh, or it could yep. be the bass drum on a drum kit on the drum set Right, yeah, on a drum. Exactly. Okay. So yeah. bass drum, you mentioned a snare drum, which yep. explain to us what a snare drum is. Snare drum is the drum that if you're playing a drum set, it's usually the one right in the middle. Mm -hmm. It uh, has either metal or wire snares on the bottom of the drum, uh, which gives it that sort of snappy sound, different from a tom-tom -tom where they touch the, 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 skin, the right? snares touch the bottom head. Yeah. And so you hear uh, sort of that psh, psh sound when you play the drum as opposed to a tom-tom where you're just going to hear like a boom or a pitch depending right. on how, the size of the drum, right? Right. And so you'll play mm -hmm. as a percussionist, you'll play those instruments uh, when needed 
uh, even if there is a drum set or if there isn't a drum set, it, you know, they, they can be independent or, or codependent. Codependent? Um, <laughs> codependent. Def- <laughs> yes, percussionists are definitely codependent. Independent or codependent of each other. I Both. don't think that's Always. what I meant. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now you mentioned also a, a xylophone or a vibraphone or a uh-huh. glockenspiel. Is it yep. spiel or spiel? Glockenspiel, yeah. Spiel. It's German. Spiel, yeah. Spiel. Okay, now that's fun to say. Um <laughs> Which are all kind of the same, and explain to us uh, what what that really is, because I don't think people really know what the difference is between those instruments or what that those instruments are. Right. So, all of those keyboard percussion instruments are based off of the white and black keys on the piano. So they will all have the um, the white keys, and then they'll have the accidentals. But obviously, they're not white and black; they're always the same material. Yeah. Because um, why make it easy? Exactly, right? <laughs> uh, and so your uh, glockenspiel is made of metal bars. Um, the vibraphone is made of metal bars. The vibraphone has a pedal that, uh, that you can dampen the bars and control the lengths of the notes. Uh, whereas on the glockenspiel, most of them don't have a, a pedal system. They just, you hit it and it just rings. But, exactly. So if you, have to, if you need to control the length of the note, you have to mute the bars with your hands and your fingers. Uh, Xylophones and marimbas traditionally are made out of wood. uh, And uh, the only main difference between a xylophone and a marimba is the size. Now I've got to be careful there because xylophones do come very large, but traditionally the xylophone nowadays is about three and a half octaves and it's a transposing instrument. So the xylophone sounds an octave higher than written. And that's the same with the glockenspiel. The glockenspiel sounds an octave higher than written. Hmm. Then, Interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and also on the the vibraphone. Correct me if I'm wrong. The vibraphone, mm-hmm. the xylophone, and the marimba. They all have tubes that are right. come off the bottom of the to. And and is that to help um, uh, tone, volume, presence, resonance? All of the above. Yeah. Okay. They amplify the sound. They act as the resonators that amplify the sound. Correct. Very cool. Okay. So we mentioned a bunch of instruments there. Now, now we can also talk about, um, let's say we're, we're, um, say in a, a Latin, Latin American type of situation, <clears throat> playing music from Latin America, Afro Cuban music, Afro jazz, that kind of thing. What, what, uh, percussion instruments would you play in that kind of a setting? So in that kind of setting, the main instruments are going to be the conga drums. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, bongos, and there'll be usually lots of uh, cowbells um, and, and wood instruments, the claves, the pieces of wood that mm-hmm. you hit together. Mm-hmm. Um, but the main instrument probably would be uh, the congas. Okay. And you have congas mm-hmm. right there. I do. Um, yes. And they so, look like, I don't know. If they I'm look gonna, uh, like. Just so everyone can see the them. There we go. Them. Epic. And so they're a very large drum as you can see. Um, And typically the uh, conga player would have three, uh, two or three congas. Mm -hmm. Traditionally back, uh, if we go back a long ways, um, each one of these drums would be played by a separate player. So there would be actually three different people playing congas. Um, And we should also back up and, and, and make reference to the fact that all of these instruments, the congas, these all uh, are actually African in ancestry. All of them. I did not know that. Yeah. That's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and what, what do they sound like just a little bit? Sure. So you have three, three different pitches. And then on each drum, um, so that generally the way they're played is um, you have one drum in the center and this one main drum, you often do a lot of different sorts of strokes. And on each conga, you can get many different sounds. So you'll have what's called the bass tone in the center. We have that flat sound. We have what's called the toe, which is my fingers heel, which is the back of my hand. So often we'll do things like heel toe with that hand. And then 
this hand, we can get all kinds of different sounds. We have a closed slap. We have a tone. We have a muted tone. And then the third one is the high pitch slap. So for example, we'll play things like That's where we, I think we need to switch to the different audio for that. When we hear one hit, it's okay, yeah. And then when as soon as you play more, we need to hear the uh, okay. From the computer so audio. let me see if I can correct that here. All right. So you'll hear this. Yeah, now, anyone who's listening to that or, or, or watching watching and listening to that, it, Bob, you make it look so easy. And this is this is the thing that I, I love. And this is the thing I said to, to you uh, yesterday, actually, was uh, everybody thinks they can play congas. And it's almost like when whenever there's a conga drum set up and someone has access to them, they just all walk over and hit them. It's like mm -hmm. you I think you any other instrumentalist, if, if you picked up my horn and started playing it, I would I would be a little perturbed. And it's almost like we all know that, you know, unless it's a conga and everyone walks over and hits it um, and they think they're totally fine. You, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and of course, part of that's awesome. They have a, like a childlike wonder with it. We, we, we're, we're attracted to the instruments. There's something really uh, primal and, and tribal and cool about, about the sound that we are attracted to. But, but it's hard to make those sounds because I, I, I think you've even quickly tried to show me once when we were goofing around, I think it was before a recording session or something years ago. And I was just, and, and my hands hurt in seconds. I was, I, I believe I was crying in the fetal position on the floor. <laughs> it was a whole thing. Many Kleenex were used. Um, no, but it, for real, like it, it's really hard and it, it's, it's very hard on the hands. And that must be learning proper technique. Is that correct? Yes, so I'm just going to switch back audio here. Sure. Uh, yes, it is proper technique. And um, it does take a very long time to learn the technique on these drums. <clears throat> Even just starting off in the beginning, um, you have to spend, like, like anything that we do, right? If we want to become good at something, we have to spend a lot of time. You know, I always tell all my students, I'm like, there's no tricks. There's no, there's no magic pill. There's just, you're going to have to spend time. The more time you spend, the better you're going to get. And on congas, yeah, I, man, I can't even tell you the number, like at the beginning when I was learning, the, like how sore my hands were and um, like just hitting the drums wrong and you hit the drum on your knuckles here on this part of the drum and you, you bruise your hands like really badly. And and if you're on a gig and you do that, and now you have to play like another hour and you've bruised your hand, now every time you hit the drum, it's like, ow, 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 right? Yeah. And, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I can empathize because, and, and I don't think people generally, even musicians, I don't think understand that about, about uh, hand, hand drum players mm -hmm. and, and uh, brass players, we, we bruise. And if we do something wrong, you know, there's some high note written or and it's got to be really loud, really. And you're like, I'm not going to miss it. And so you pinch and you pull this metal piece against against these little pieces of mm -hmm. lip um, mm -hmm. that you're using. And then you bruise or you tire and then it starts to inflame and it gets all big. Yeah. And now you've got two hours of aggressive <laughs> playing ahead of you and, and, it, and it hurts. Yeah. You yeah. know, it hurts and you can barely mm. make a good sound. So you cut more corners in order to just get through the night. And mm -hmm. I, I, I can relate a little bit there. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, yeah. yeah. I and conga drums, I, I used to, I used to always like when I first started playing conga drums and, uh, and hand drums and, and I couldn't get a lot of volume and I was, you know, hitting harder and harder and harder. And, and I couldn't get a lot of volume. And I'd listen to, you know, my friends that had been playing for a long time and they would, they would have this amazing volume and their, and their hands weren't sore and they weren't, their hands weren't, their fingers weren't all split open and bleeding like mine were. And 
It was literally one day. It was probably about five years after playing congas. And I was sitting, I'll never forget it because I was sitting in my living room and I was practicing and all of a sudden it was just like, boom. Hmm. And there was, um, there it was. I had this volume and it was not hitting the drums hard. So to get volume out of these drums, it's all about momentum. Hmm. So it's all about weight and gravity. And so to get a loud sound out of the conga, it's about using the weight of my arm so it's about momentum and not force so the more weight i can have in my arm down to the drum the the bigger the uh tone i get the better the volume i get and i can actually i can compete with a drum set player who's hitting with sticks and i can compete with the same volume and not hurt my hands because it's about how i'm playing the drums but to get to that point, you have to, you have to get there. It's like, you, it's like, I kind of call it, it's like when you're learning something, it's like you turn the page and, and then you're like, I've got it. And then you turn the page and then all of a sudden, then you're like, oh, and now I have all this to learn. But that's the way it is. And it was, you know. Yeah. I, I, so. I mean, as, as a trouble player, as a brass player, <laughs> everything you're saying makes sense. Yeah. Um, what I'm hearing in the way our approach is, is, is learning to use the air. And for me, I let the lips, um, I do this thing when I teach, I, I hope I won't bore you with this, but I do this thing when I teach where I go, okay, this is, this is how you're playing the trumpet. And they put the, put their lips together and they go, you know, this is how we're, we're taught, right? And they do this. Now do this, right? And that's how we're all taught. So as right. soon as you do that and you put it, put a, put a trumpet on someone's face or any brass instrument you go <laughs> you sound like a, every grade seven yes. beginner trumpet player and i right. and and so when i first thing i usually do when i'm talk to, you know talking to people is going because what you're talking about what i hear is you're talking about effortless or mastery mm -hmm. and and, a, and the, using just the weight of gravity and the natural flow uh, of your of your hand to create and then when you say you're competing with volume, I hear uh, resonance. I hear more resonance in what you're doing. So when you strike, your body's relaxed and your body's part of the instrument and it creates a, a sound that resonates in a room more than just hitting something and making it like a loud pierce. Right. It, yeah. it has a weight to it and uh, sonically. So it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. a larger, you know, more overtones. Am, am I correct in saying that? Correct, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, like, yeah. so, so we do, I always do this thing and I go, this, well, this is what you're doing and this is what you were taught to do and this is what i do and and when i do it on the on the mouthpiece and it's not buzzing right okay. and when i do it and when i do that so now without trying to even get a good sound you can hear it's better and then when you practice with that approach that's when you can start to to you know and control the pitch a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, so what you're saying, it, it just, it makes perfect sense to me. I don't know if I, mm -hmm. I would ever have the time to be able to learn how to do it the way you do, but it's, it's, it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, and that's just the conga. Um, mm -hmm. So, so you're, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, do you have bongos there you can show us so people can see what bongos uh, I do, but you know what they're, over there i could well, these, grab these, them these are these these are bongos, yeah. right those okay. are bongos yes. yeah okay i got the, these in the Cuba. small drums yeah nice yeah yeah and yeah. um the uh and the, the bongos game. are the very the very high pitched ones yes okay the, especially maybe, the small drum is very high pitched yes it is right yeah mm -hmm. and now i i um i uh uh, so, so basically, the, the similar techniques on the bongo is the conga, I would assume. Mm -hmm. And then any yeah. kind of time you're using a hand drum, is that similar? Yes, for the most part. Um, okay. When you go to smaller drums, you use more, more fingers um, and oh. less hand because you don't have the drum smaller. So you don't have room on the drum to use your whole hand. So when you're playing bongos, you're often using just like one, one or two fingers. Um, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to see here, this happened last week where I couldn't see any comments. 
Like no oh, comments okay. are coming. So I just want to uh, remind anyone, um, as long as you're watching this live or listening to this live, yeah. um, uh, ask any questions, uh, absolutely say hi. I'm just going to see if, um, yeah, I just don't see, um, uh, I th it, it might just be probably that I'm just technically inept in this, but it seems like they've changed the, um, mm. the, the way that this displays. So I just want to, Okay. If there are any comments, uh, let me know if anyone uh, knows me and isn't, is commenting and it's not coming through, um, maybe send me a text cause that'll pop up or send me a message or something. Cause then I'll, I'll look a little, Oh no, here we go. Okay. So we do have comments. Oh, uh, good. Norm Barnicat yeah. says hi. And John yeah. Abraham says hi. Norm is a oh, CGO cool. subscriber and, uh, and yeah. John, of course, you know, the trombonist. Hi John. John yes. Yeah. Hi John. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, let's try something silly here. I, I can't believe I'm going to maybe do this, but do you, do, you, do you think you could show me how to suck less on, on bongos so people okay. can see how so, difficult these are? So do I need to get my bongos? Uh, or use your conga. You, you, what okay, you just use? use my congas? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, um, so you're going to uh, want to put uh, one hand in the center of the drum. Okay. Ow. Okay, I already hurt okay. myself. Is that... <laughs> <laughs> That's a badge of honor. Okay, so I've got the large drum, which is not very large, and the tiny drum. Um, so I'm going to put one in yeah. the center of the drum. Of the small drum. Yeah. So like, okay. like, like this? In the, right, right into the center of the, of the drum, like ah, that. Ah, okay. Okay, okay. Yeah. Now, you can take your other hand. Yeah. And you're going to go with your fingers right on the uh, on the side of the drum like that. Okay. And you're going to make, yeah. And so then you go one with the other hand, one and two and three and, and then four and will be on the bigger drum. Okay. So it'll be one and two and three and four and one. Can I get a gig? Yeah. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> the, I mean, that's hard. It's hard. Uh, just the coordination and keeping it in time, but also the tones. I'm, I mean, I'm sure these aren't the best drums, but that's not the issue. Because if mm -hmm. I know if you pick these up, you'd get great tones. So, so we're talking about tone production um, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, getting Correct. great tone. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And what we were doing was all of the closed strokes, which are the easiest strokes. And because... I still sound terrible. <laughs> that <we're laughs> it's, it's very good you're, you're a you're a quick study johnny oh you um wow okay it uh, th these things are incredibly incredibly difficult um let's talk about some of the other percussion instruments so sure behind you on your on your shelf i see uh, shakers i see tam now you know mm -hmm. i love tambourines you know it's it's there, there are even times where we're doing something, especially in gospel music and funk music and soul music when mm. we're playing, and you'll go to the congas. I'm like, no, I need more tambourine. Um, <laughs> because I, I, I love it, right? I love that sound. Yeah. Um, and I'm even thinking of uh, uh, when we recorded Sweet Jubilation with the Calgary mm. Jazz Orchestra. Mm -hmm. The last track is about uh, Jubilation is about 10 or 11 minutes long and about mm -hmm. 7 minutes of that is that ding, 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 and, and you're pretty much on tambourine for for like 7 minutes <laughs> or 8 yeah. minutes yes fast like non-stop yes did, uh, did it hurt? and I think you yes. had 2 takes of it um, yes yeah okay yes um, I think <laughs> I think that's why everybody hates me. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is, um, I always tell all of my students, yeah. I say to them, okay, there's two things. You're two things. You're a musician and you're an athlete. Mm -hmm. What we do is very physical. Mm -hmm. If you do not approach playing drums from the standpoint of an athlete, you are going to, you are going to get injured. You are going to hurt yourself. Absolutely. And so in those situations, you know, when it's like, okay, we're into five minutes of playing tambourine and my arm is starting to lock up and cramp up and my, you know, and I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, Lord, 
how am I going to get through this? Yeah. I, ha- I like consciously have to think, okay, breathe. And I focus it all in and I focus on my breathing and I focus on relaxing. Cause that's the other thing is it's like, as we get tight, we tense up and we're like, Oh gosh, Oh gosh. Oh! And that's the worst thing we can do. Right. So it's like, just focus in and then just like start breathing as if I'm running a marathon and really deep, heavy breathing and try to relax more and more and more and more and more. Otherwise you will seize up and you will hurt yourself. And, and I, and I can speak from that, from, from experience. I have had issues with tendonitis and Mm -hmm. um, injuries that way. And, um, and so I know what that's about. I know what it's like to, to have to stop playing and go to physiotherapy five days a week because I had bad posture. I wasn't breathing properly and I, I injured myself. I have tendonitis in both, both arms. And now, so, and, yeah. And, and you've done that. I've done that. I, I mean, most musicians have done that to some, when I was in university, I got tendonitis cause I was practicing velocity studies too, too much. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think my mom asked me to, prune some big tree and I went out there for six hours after I'd done eight hours of this every you know that day and 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 then my whole arm just lit up on fire um the and I've definitely done that though as a musician as a trumpet player I've done it playing lead uh where I'm I'm tired uh I was playing too loudly or something to fatigue myself did Mm -hmm. something wrong and then start tensing my whole body and just trying to just trying to get the notes to come out Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, created issues. And, mm-hmm. um, yeah. and I think a lot yeah. of musicians have done that. Like, like um, mm-hmm. you know, a, a lot of drummers talk about that. And, and um, a lot of trumpet players have like head and neck issues. Yeah, and, and, yeah. yeah. Lots, same drummers were, yeah. we, we have neck, shoulders, arm issues, Knees back issues, <laughs> uh, posture, right? Like a, yeah. lot of, a lot of drummers, when they sit, when they're playing, you know, you'll see conga players and they'll be like this when, you know, you need yeah. to be like, like this, you yes. need to be, you need to be using your core strength just as a trumpet player, right? You yes. got to be, everything's got to be there. You got to be firmly planted on the ground. You got to be square. You got to be breathing. You have to be that grounded, that centered, that, you know, and, and using your whole body, your whole core strength to facilitate what you can do and yeah. as you know we have to practice for the gig so i practiced in my studio for your tune for hours playing that tambourine part at triple forte because i knew come the gig that's what i was going to have to do yeah. so if i didn't and train there might be, that, it's there like, might be- the, uh, you know, I might have said we're doing it again. We're doing it again. Yeah. We're do- we might exactly. have done six takes. That's right. That's and right. It's just expected. And, yeah. yeah. Just like a marathon runner. If the marathon runner doesn't train to run a marathon, he's not going to, he or she's not going to make it. Right? right. Plus all so, the other things we did. Exactly. Yeah. Right. I remember yeah, doing, exactly. um, uh, 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 Mark Wilson, the trombonist, put together a um, Winton Marsalis septet tribute. Um, because he loved the music and, and I love the music of the, the, you know, from the late nineties that Wynton Marsalis did. And I remember I practiced every day, all the easy songs and, uh, and memorized them and then practiced all the hard songs because, and then I'd play them all in set order. Um, so that, it, and I think I did that for like five months. Because when we mm. finally started doing the shows, I knew I needed to be able to do that night after night and not, mm. you know, mm-hmm. and, and I still struggle because what Winton plays is pretty mm-hmm. amazing. But um, now I, I will so, so, say, I, I will say something, no, because about this thing of playing the tambourine or um, again, especially like doing, you know, when we're playing something like Sweet Jubilation, right? There's the energy that, that comes from playing that piece and you become consumed by that that joy and that that celebration and it does become effortless because because it's you're just like i'm you know i'm having so much fun and i'm just i'm just enjoying it so much that it's just like you know it's just happening right yeah. and then you know and then after the gig then i'm like oh <laughs> <laughs> hopefully no. hopefully you didn't well, abandon your technique you know, I lost you. 
there hopefully. See, I get excited. Yeah. You, I know. I've noticed <laughs> that about you. Um, <laughs> but see, that's I the resemble best. that comment. Th that yeah. is. So that's one of the things I've always admired about you, Bob, is because I know you focus on the technique and you folk, you take it seriously. Um, and especially as a percussionist, time is so important, doing everything in time and in pocket. So not just in tempo, but in groove, um, continuously uh, locking with the rhythm section, locking with the bass player and listening, listening. And then on top of that, doing it effortlessly, then doing it musically and having fun. And that's mm -hmm. that's really what it's all about so all of the other stuff is is the support so that you can just open up and and be jubilant and just have joy and just you know just just ride that wave of oh, we get to play music right now you know but not but but not only do that you have to have the that crazy discipline behind it to make it through night after mm -hmm. night and and sound the way you want to sound or and then and then of course we all look at that and go well, how do I sound better next time? But um, Okay, uh, Amy Essen just wrote, that's a long time, Amy Essenberg. Hi, Amy. Um, and I think she's referring to the, the tambourine playing. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I recall, because I, you know how much I love tambourine. Mm. Um, and I'm thinking when, you, when you're talking about your conga strikes, um, mm -hmm. is that if you, uh, you're basically just letting your, your arm move uh, effortlessly right like it's mm -hmm. because i remember once doing a like a gospel tambourine thing you know from a horn section or something in the middle of something and i, I had to play tambourine for five minutes or something not anything crazy like the sweet jubilation tempo and stuff but it was mm -hmm. just that foot to check it to check and trying to make it groove and pocket and not lose time with the and wow was my arm sore like mm -hmm. i <laughs> i um so is, is that what what's the technique then with a tambourine to, to be able to to do that effortlessly? So uh, let's see here. Um, so as, as you I don't know if you can see that back there, but um, I have I have lots of tambourines and I I once commented, I think, on uh, on, on one of your shows, Johnny, where where I said, um, oh, I said, oh, this is this is a good gig. This is a seven tambourine gig. <laughs> yeah, <that's right>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, 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 I, yeah. I mean, sometimes, sometimes I'll bring out. I'll, I'll have like seven. I don't think I've ever quite had seven instruments on stage. Yeah, I, I think I maybe five or six. But like, yeah. but yeah, that sometimes it's the right. It's just the right tool, right? That's right. And because just like your many of your trumpets, they all sound different. All of the tambourines sound different, and you play them differently as well so for example um like because you know i love the drum tambourine i think is my favorite but this is the so this is would be what they call the sort of more the the rock and roll tambourine is that more um, like this one that i have yes okay, yeah yeah um now this one um is um you'll notice it might be a slightly different shape than yours uh very similar um this one has it looks like rubber your, your, what do you call these things uh, these are jingles. Tam they're they're uh, yeah jingles. They're called jingles. Okay, so like your mm -hmm. jingles are offset to mine. Yes. Yeah. So these are offset, and these ones are also tambourine jingles. Uh, come in many different metals. Some are tin. These are brass. Um, if you get into the orchestral tambourines, then we get into like phosphor bronze and copper and German silver and. And they all bits. sound different. They all sound different. They all sound yeah. different, and they're mm -hmm. splitting hairs. Some of them, I assume. Because yeah, even like exactly. on the bottom there, I've got, uh, how can I, I'm trying to get yeah. skilled at this. There we go. On the <laughs> bottom there, I've got uh, trumpet mutes. And I think I have probably 30 different straight mutes. And I've got six different harmons and, and seven different plunger mutes. And right. you know, 15 and something cut mutes. Like I've even bought vintage ones because they, they sound totally different. You know, they're mm -hmm. expensive, but they're, you know, 100 years old. And so, mm -hmm. so they're, they're different, but they're very similar. Mm -hmm. So depending on what you're playing, you, you pick something. Yes. Else. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, this particular tambourine, um, this, it has rubber uh, on, so you can see where it's blue there. Right. This okay. is actual rubber. So oh, okay. when you're hitting your hand, it doesn't hurt as much. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. See? <laughs> I was thinking of just putting like, like, um, uh, padding, you know, from a, like a straight jacket or something around here to, uh, 
Right? <laughs> yes. Okay, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So so on this, what's the what, what are you thinking about to make this through a 7-minute situation? Um often and again here it is it, it's all in the in my posture. Okay. It's in keeping my my shoulders square so that my arm isn't out too far, right? Okay. And and then I'm thinking this motion as opposed to this motion trying to shake it right 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 yeah so, you're so just it's kind more of, of a flopping? yeah a and on word? this one i'm actually i don't know if you can see that your wrist. but i'm actually using quite a bit of wrist okay yeah so i can i can do it without even without even using my arm wow that's so much easier and then then wow. you can use your arm on two and four Ah, that's so much easier. Right? So. Wow. Same thing there. You have to change audio. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but yeah, why don't we change audio and, and show us uh, show us like six different freaking cool tambourine grooves on different tambourines. Okay. Just, just rapid fire. Rapid fire tambourine. Rapid, rapid fire, fire tambourine. tambourine. Here we go. Okay. And then you can get things like where you drop the sound down. So there's that yeah. one. You have, I'm going to just take this out so that I, I can uh, hear. Um, you have your little tiny tambourine. You can do the same thing. But now we're hearing that head sound really pop, right? I'll come back to this one in a second. Um, this is uh, an orchestral tambourine. So um, this one has a goat skin head. Um, it's, this one does have the silver and copper uh, uh, jingles. So you can hear this one has really got a, a very full sound to the jingles. So on the, we'll often do things like that where we can get like what's called like a thumb roll or like a, a roll that way. I can get a roll this way. Like stuff like that. I can even do things like playing the tambourine on my leg, like, or even like this. And then we have several other different tambourines, and then we have sort of that gospel style stuff that you were talking about, which is that type of thing. is the tambourine is moving this way and my hand is moving opposite direction. So that's yeah that's that's very cool and you know I love the gospel I love gospel tambourine that approach and the and the orchestral tambourine actually I really like that sound. Um, yeah, and I love the drum tambourine sound. That's uh, all very different. Yeah, and I mean I'll even have several different, you know, like these two sound very different from each other. This one compared to right. Yeah. Yeah, very different. And of course that, um, my so to my ears as a director, already when you play those different sounds, I like a lot of them. And then I'm thinking, wow, would I ever, uh, but depending on the, the tones that the drum set player sets up and the mm -hmm. cymbals he uses or he or she, or, or what, you know, like say with the Calgary Jazz Orchestra, we've got 13 horns. So sonically, um, you know, one of those tambourines might interfere with what's going on over here. Mm -hmm. So we need to change that. Um, and I think now that hasn't come up too much. So I'm thinking you you are either actively thinking like that as well or or just subconsciously. You're just aware of 
when I'm playing this, I'm not hearing the melody. And so you're, you're instinctually just because of your experience, you're picking a different instrument. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's totally it. Um, I'd like to say that I, that I consciously know what I'm doing, but I don't think it is conscious. I think in my head, I just hear what, what sound I want to add to the, the music that I'm playing. I'm going to switch back here because I'm getting echo. All right. Um, so as the percussionist, I'm always trying to complement what I'm, what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. And so I hear sound and I hear in my head and I hear it like, it's like colors. Like I'm, I'm everything that I do as a percussionist, I'm, I'm painting with sound and, and I'll just hear in my head something. And often it's like, I don't even know what it is that I'm hearing, but I will just pick up one of my instruments and it'll be like, yeah, that's the one that is the sound, whether it's, you know, and often with the tambourines, it'll be, sometimes it is based on the style of music. Certain tambourines work better with different, different styles of music. So there's that as a given. So sometimes be like, okay, I'll use this tambourine, but other times it often, and I guess this is kind of where that comes in is when I'm practicing and I'm at home and I'm listening and I'm practicing, I'm going, yeah, you know what? That tambourine doesn't work. It's too bright or it's too full. It's like it, I'm not hearing the clarity of the rhythm. Uh, so I will practice that at home um, and then try to then make sure that I'm picking the one that, like you said, that complements the music the best, that fits in the best, that isn't mm -hmm. um, covering up something, that it's, so, that I'm so it's also contributing. Like, it's one thing when we sight read something and then if we do that, um, I know, I know I'm already thinking when I play, I go, uh, um, as you know, I have two, two main trumpets that I use and they look identical and everyone goes, well, what's the difference? And I'm like, well, this one costs a little bit more, you know, like it's so hard to explain. Um, they, they resonate completely differently. And, and, you know, basically one is, is this weight of sound and one is this weight of sound so i can i can make this one sound warm and dark, but that's it's more fatiguing or i can make this one sound brighter but it's more fatiguing so I, it's just picking mm -hmm. the right tool between the two for me and plus you know flugelhorn are the other things i play but then i put mutes in and we'll run through something here in a rehearsal and i'll go that's the wrong cut mute now of course because we rehearse mm -hmm. right next to my office i can I'll run in here and grab it because I'm a geek, but, and I'll go, no, this is what I want to, you know, use on this. But, um, but if I, if we were rehearsing somewhere else, I'd be doing the same as far as choices I could make. Mm -hmm. So if we rehearse something, we sight read something, you then go home and you're, you're thinking about the music and you're, you're thinking, no, my, my toolkit is going to change for the next rehearsal and for the gig. Yeah, true. However, when I'm coming to the rehearsal, I try to, I always bring more than I need because yeah. I want to be able to have tools there at the rehearsal. Now, sometimes I don't have, obviously I'm not going to bring all, you know, to, to every rehearsal, but I, I, I want probably, 52 tambourines at every that, rehearsal. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but for example, if we're doing one of your soul gospel shows, I will bring at least four tambourines to the first rehearsal. I mean, it makes, it makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like when we do the um, the Art of Soul show every year, it's um, mm -hmm. you know we're doing uh, Motown and soul and funk and and you have to because it's yeah. it's such a huge part of that sound and huge part of the sound that I love right in the in the rhythm section. Um, okay, so let's let's um, obviously there's tons of other things there, but we've got um, um, shakers. Obviously, we'll, we'll talk about shakers. We've got the um, the wind chimes, uh, you, chimes is just what you call them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, you know, I, I, I almost, I, I can't, when was the last time I actually said, please play chimes? <laughs> right. It's like the one thing I just, and you'll play it. And I'm like, no, please, Bob. No, <laughs> but there are times where they're awesome. 
Um, yes. And uh, I don't know why I'm funny that way, but um, okay. So what, what do you call, I know this is a guiro, but like what, what do you call this type of an instrument or this family of instrument? Like where you're doing They're, a uh, guiros. Yeah. All guiros. guiros. Or, okay. Or guiro. Yeah. Guiro. Okay. And then, yeah. um, and then uh, you've got an incredible amount of, of shakers. Um, and I tend to see you use those ones, like the colorful one behind you with the the handle on the on the top. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. uh, I, I see you tend to use ones like that a lot. And you hold them. You don't hold them by the stick. I don't think ever. You always hold them in the by the body. When I see you play, mm -hmm. um, is that for a, a a control of of the insides, or is that for a tone or resonance thing? Yeah. Um, so you're holding them on the body so that you get, um, cause on these, these shakers. So these shakers are called Kashishi, these particular ones, which is a basket shaker. Um, and it's got a piece of hard plant on the bottom. Where does that and then in Kashishi come from? Where, where, where? They're from, uh, from Africa. Okay. And, uh, Kashishi is, um, also a funny word because it's really funny as well. Um, it's spelt C A X I X I. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> Kashishi. Um, it's, and so, am I clipping out? No, nope, I think you're good. And then you oh, have. Yeah, you're clipping now. It's clipping now. We'll have to switch over. Yeah. Thanks, folks, for your patience and lack of technology. I, um, I play acoustic instruments and I'm technically not inclined. So, you have your Kashishi. <laughs> Amazing. I like I like those. Yeah, because like you share some of my favorite. Yeah. Okay, so we've got the and and so what what is the uh, what is the the main technical premise for because one of the things I find as a complete shaker novice is whenever I have any of these or, or any of the handheld, you know, those little like drum looking ones and stuff, mm -hmm. whenever I have any of those and I'm trying to, especially if I'm asked to, because as you know a lot of the time uh, horn players or stuff are, are our singers are asked to play those things when when not yeah. but like just keeping it in any kind of a steady rhythm like i'm trying to find the weight of the but it's so hard <laughs> it's really See, yeah, like like to be already, perfect in time yes, and time. you're already doing what you what you have to do when you play shakers okay so it's if I just go straight back and forth, you just hear straight sound. Yeah, right. Right? But you were going... Right. You were adding the accent. So you're giving it that groove. A little bit of pocket, chaka, chaka, yeah. Chaka, chaka, yeah. Chaka, 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 chaka. So that's the most important thing. It's just, it, yeah. just like anything else. Keep it grooving. It's all about the pocket. Yeah. It's all about finding the groove. And with shakers, it's all about the weight that we talked about before on the congas. Right. It's all about that weight and knowing where that weight is, where so, it sits in the in the beat. So right. if the if the groove is like do cat do cat, right? Then that weight is on one, two. Three, four, right? right? So you're feeling that weight. Right. Where the beat is. It's, it's everything's about pocket, man, in the end. At the, the, the highest level, man. Holy smokes. And it's um, weight. And it's all about gravity. So if momentum. I have to ever come and play one of these beside you then, I, is, I'm just I'm just gonna all I'm gonna do is focus on groove and you you won't laugh at me after. Focus on the groove? Okay. That's cool, um, man. Okay, cool. The, so there's so so many things now. Um, uh, uh, we, you've also got like you've got. I've seen you play castanets and uh, triangles, of course, and and uh, what what other things come up? 
like you, you and you have a thing that looks similar to what they got on the shaker like it's like a big ball of beads i think mm. um, that you use yes uh this one no it's not that but no. that's cool too like what is that like, oh I know i've heard I, you play it a bunch but oh you're referring to the uh you're referring to the small version of this. Okay. So this is um, what's called a shekere. Uh, and it is a, with beads around it. Um, but you're referring to a kabasa, which is okay. the small one with, the, with the, the beads on it. And I don't have it with me right here, right That's now. okay. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, and it's just just to create different tones, different sounds. It's so everything else is variations, essentially simplifying, but variations mm -hmm. of the theme of creating tones and, and mm -hmm. having different tones and different sounds that 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 are musical that fit the pocket and fit the style. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. and and uh, and you're locking in the whole time with the the bass player and the drummer and the and the the band and creating a groove. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think that's awesome, man. I, I hope I hope everyone understands now that the difference between that and because I know we've even finished um, a CJO concert or or another concert when we've done with, you know, with with the eight piece group or with other different different all the different things we've done and played. But I, I remember specifically on multiple occasions, people going up and saying, you know, really, like, what is the difference and what is he and, and I'm, you know, explain it. But I think hearing you do it and 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 show the different instruments man that's that's really cool um hmm. rose fensky says this is very interesting uh, hi mom <laughs> <laughs> oh she's, man you know she's my biggest fan and uh you know being a drummer and a percussionist and somebody who makes a lot of noise all the time i used to always think that you know um that it was driving my mom nuts and one of the things my mom said to me when i was had moved out was she said i miss your drums Oh, so, yeah. Hey, Mom. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm assuming it was. She also knew that you were working hard and training and studying and practicing. It's not. Yeah. It's not just making noise when you know your, your. Yeah. Uh, you can see you moving forward. Yeah, my parents were um, incredibly supportive of what I was doing and supporting me and providing that um, that place and driving me from Stetler to Edmonton for drum lessons every second weekend. Did like, you grow up in Stetler? I did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think when I was in grade nine, uh, I started taking drum lessons in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. And so every second weekend, I was driving to Edmonton for, for drum lessons. And um, yeah, it, uh, it was a commitment. And they were committed to helping me do that, to ensure that I was, you know, given all of those things to allow me to grow and and become the percussionist, right? That I am. Amazing. So, yeah. Amazing, and that's um, that's amazing because we ne you need that support. I mean, mm -hmm. in anything, children need that support, but, yes. but musicians yeah. need that. You know, you need that um, understanding. That's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, then, hi, mom. Thanks for <laughs> driving him to drum lessons. Um, okay, so that's a big question. Then, are you a Calgary Flames fan or an Edmonton Oilers fan? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um speaking of controversial yeah. statements yes i think i'll just uh plead the fifth okay so, um yeah. where where did you uh so you studied music at the um after that after the drum lessons in edmonton mm -hmm. you studied uh classical percussion at uh you did a performance degree i believe at the university of calgary is that correct uh actually at the university of alberta was my first degree oh okay what was yeah. your was that your first degree or what was it uh, yeah, so my first degree was uh, my Bachelor of Music in uh, Performance uh, Percussion uh, at the University of Alberta. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did per percussion performance as my major and uh, voice was my minor, actually. Mm -hmm. Really? Will you sing something for us right now? Um, perhaps not. <laughs> 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 oh man okay uh, can i get you to sing something on a show maybe you'll sing harmonies sure. with me. i would love to oh that'd be yeah fun. i would love to do that yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah mm -hmm. um 
<laughs> and uh, okay, and then so that you said that was your first degree. Did you do a degree at the University of Calgary as well? I did, yeah. So after I finished my ma- or bachelor's at U of A, I moved to Calgary and I did my master's degree in classical percussion as well. So I have a master's of music uh, in performance percussion from awesome. the University of Calgary. Yeah. Um, what was what was the what are the what was the kind of the biggest thing that you got out of your I mean, I know that's that's we're talking about six years of study, but um, mm. you know, when you come out of that, what 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 was your thought? What was your like? Okay, what did I learn from that? Like, what was the oh, found, wow. what are the what are the key foundational elements? I guess that's what I'm asking about. Boy, that's tough because um, there's so much. Uh, I think it's that that thing of when we are playing music with with other musicians. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons why I love classical music so much is that there's so many emotions that are evoked depending on what we're playing and what type of music we're playing. And we have this connection with the musicians that we're playing with. And and especially in classical music, I don't know, it just seems, I want to say almost it's a little bit more intimate. It just seems like there's more, um, it's, it's just really deep and connecting and we, we have to connect with each other on, on such a high level of beyond intellect, beyond emotion, beyond um, technique that it is, you know, we're, we're creating this. And then when we share that with the audience, I mean, it's in all music that we play, right? Mm-hmm. But um, especially when it comes to classical music, because a lot of it is really hard. You know, and so we spend so many hours uh, working on that. I guess it, you know what, on it applies to all this detail, music. The smallest detail, the smallest note, yeah. uh, a yeah. piece of a measure that's that that that's um, very much part of of, of mm-hmm. performing tradition. You know, like trying to perform mm-hmm. any music, right, at a, at a high mm-hmm. level. But um, wow. Okay, so it's yeah. it's the, it, the the passion and the preparation. Then is that what we're? Yeah, I think so. You know, it's. You know, I think that's one of the things that I did that I loved so much about being in school is that, you know, when you're in university and I know that you and you and Jim Johnson talked about this before, but you're that's what you're doing. You're doing that. You're eating, sleeping, breathing 24 hours a day Mm -hmm. music and you're you don't have to do anything else. You're just focused on you're practicing, you're preparing, you're you're getting together with other musicians and you're like, hey, we should play this piece together. And then, you're yeah, and you get a bunch of people together and you you work on that and you prepare concerts and you're just living, eating, sleeping, breathing music 24 seven. Right. Yeah. Man. And, you know, and then we finish our degrees and then we have to come out and then we have to all of a sudden now um, make a living at this. And right. so then, so then that is what we're doing when we're playing and performing for people. But then there's all that other stuff that, you obviously know a lot about is the business side of being the musician, right? And that unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you look at it, but that takes a lot of time. And that's and not taught to us no. in school at all. <laughs> not at all. Um, not I, at all. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing of programs in the States, like at Berkeley and stuff where that's, it is being taught now. You know, mm. the, and the, and, and the ever evolving, um, ways that we have to do you know that because the, the, the business changes and the industry changes just mm-hmm. like all marketing and all business change right but mm-hmm. yeah that's a whole that's yeah. a whole different Ooh, that's man. a whole different yep. discussion it but is yeah you're, yep. you're right and 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 you have to every individual musician has to figure out how that works for themselves um as freelance mm-hmm. musicians or as musicians that are that are on a scene um and and then the leaders uh, that's a whole mm-hmm. different thing and artists that's a whole different thing you know that's um mm-hmm. yeah you're right but that's um that immersion it, it's funny because for me that's been a thing that um that the cjo has been really good at for me uh because uh, you know as the director if we're doing um the music of so and so um i just immerse myself and then i'll like when we did benny goodman i was lifting benny goodman solos on my trumpet and 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 then um, lifting sections of his writing, 
um, maybe not necessarily a whole tune, but different sections of the people who wrote for him and arranged for him and just trying to understand it so that when I'm mm. better and deeper, so that when I'm directing and when I'm trying to put the band together and make us sound like we're whatever we are doing. Um, and I think that's one of the things I like. And then we all get together and we, everything you've talked about to every single musician, when you're, when you're thinking about what tambourine, because of the weight of the jingle or what it's made out of, you're going to use on a specific piece. And we, every player is doing that, you know, and Jim is doing that as a drummer. And I know Igor does that as a piano player and he goes and, and lifts and listens to all the records and all the, um, and then he comes back to me. And uh, especially if it's a tune I've, I've lifted and he goes, John, you've missed note, one note here. I'm like, yes, <laughs> much, man. How? Like, yes, you're right. I did, you know, uh, um, and and because he's getting into it and he's delving into the music. And I love that because that to me was a huge part of the reason I wanted the CJO was to be a real world university for us, you know, like. Yeah, um, it's fantastic. You know, that, that we get more out of it than just a, a performance, you know. Well, and I got it. I, here you go. So gospel tambourine. I had not played gospel tambourine until you said, I want you to play gospel tambourine. <laughs> and you sent me a video of Herlin Riley. Herlin and Riley. I went. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I dove in and was like, okay. And I had to learn how to play gospel tambourine you know, for that recording session. Right. So, I mean, you, you took me to school, man. So thank you. My, my pleasure. And I, amazing. You, you, you did such an incredible job on that. Really. Like it just, um, I, I know the effort behind that and the technique behind that. And we, as we just, you know, showed everybody. Um, and then it's, it's hours and hours of practice, mm -hmm. you know, a couple hours a day for weeks, for, for, for months, for years and then bringing those those techniques and skills and things you're working on to the shows and then learning from it and digesting it and then going what should i what can i do to improve this and taking it back again but doing it in in a joyful setting not in a uh beating yourself up setting because that's too easy right um, yeah it's too easy to beat ourselves up um amen to yeah, that yeah that's uh that's that's a real i think that's the biggest pitfall um, and what we're talking about, I think, is the complete antithesis of what the world teaches us talent is. And for a long time, I got, I got really upset when someone said so-and-so is talented. And I, to the point that I wouldn't use the phrase, the word, sorry, anymore, because mm. I would use skilled. Because, because the understanding of it is you go on a, well, no, no, can you sing? Oh, you should just go on the show and they'll tell you if you sing. And then if you sing, they'll make you a star. And we've seen that. And we've seen, you know, people throw millions and millions of dollars at, at, to to market someone who wins a, a, a talent competition. And those are great, but they're not, that's not really, that's not it. Um, do you love it? Do you, it, Tommy Banks said this to me once. Do you have a fire in your belly? And are you prepared to work harder than any, uh, uh, and he wasn't talking down about this, but than than a doctor or a lawyer does and continue studying for the rest of your life um do you have a fire in your belly for music to do that and mm. if you do i guarantee you'll be successful and more importantly i guarantee you'll be happy in ways that you can't explain because you're in the right place that was that's beautiful that was, that was tommy's advice to me. yeah ah uh, yeah um Yes. When I was like, I think I was like 21, I was just finishing university and he said that to me. And I'm like, okay. I'm because I was thinking about going into law. I was going to use music uh, as pre law. Okay. Be a lawyer. But um, mm. yeah, that was, uh, th there were there were some people that were around me that, that steered me differently. So, mm. um, okay. Well, uh, okay. So this, so this is something that's, that's fascinating, I think, about you. Um, and so you come out of university and, you started playing with a group uh, called Barrage. Um, and how old were you when you started playing with Barrage? 27? Uh, okay. 26, 27, yeah, okay. something like that. So you're yeah. mid-20s-ish and you're, mm -hmm. uh, you've got a master's in, uh, in music performance, in classical music, and now mm -hmm. you're playing in a group that was, um, is it fair to say it was, it was riding a bit of the popularity wave of the Riverdance era? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so the group was set up um, with fiddlers and guitarists and bass guitar and drums and percussion and dancers too. Was it dancers as well? Well, we the so when we first started, mm -hmm. it was seven violins and wow. there was it seven violins and uh, it was an offshoot of the Calgary Fiddlers. Um, and they had created this group. And uh, so Dean Marshall, the artistic director, played piano. He played a uh, keyboard. So he played bass with his left hand. Mm -hmm. And um, they hired uh, a guitar player um, who many of you know out there, Aaron Young. He's a, a phenomenal Amazing guitar player. Yeah. And mm -hmm. at the time, um, they hired... so. It was, a, it was the craziest audition process ever. So they gave me all their CDs and they said, pick three contrasting styles, play on whatever you want, and, and then and come back to us. And so here's this classical percussionist who um, has played a lot of multiple percussion setups in university. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is like uh, setups that will include tom-toms and tambourines and wood blocks and cymbals and triangles and bass you're, drums. You're and, moving around in the piece. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're often playing very melodically. Um, so you're playing the percussion instruments, but playing from a melody standpoint almost more so than from a, from a rhythmical. I mean, the rhythmical standpoint is there, but it's not like groove like on a drum set or like a conga groove. And so I was like, okay, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I created setups I, I got together and i pulled out all my instruments and i created this crazy weird hybrid multiple percussion drum set setup and just listened to the music and came up with my own ideas mm -hmm. and then i went back and i said okay this is what i got and they were like cool now learn these three tunes and this process went on i think it was like about six auditions later and i got the gig and um, so there I was, and I was playing this like multiple percussion drum set and I was playing very melodically. I was playing the way, the way I would, I would hear it. And so that kind of created how I approached playing, playing with the band. And I think they liked it because it was, it was that it wasn't just a typical drum set. Mm -hmm. So, so I did that. Aaron was playing guitar and then Dean so, and the fiddle players just stood there. Nobody was dancing yet. And then we kind of gradually started to incorporate choreography in the band um i think it was about a year and a half maybe two years in they decided to expand the band and they said um you know we're gonna add a bass player and we're gonna add a drum set player and we want you to now play percussion and i was like okay great and they're like we want you to play some mallet instruments and so i was like fantastic because marimba was one of my main instruments during university and uh and i'll never forget it. they're like do you play congas and my reply was i've I played will. congas. <laughs> I will. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, <laughs> and I'll never get it. You know, I'll never forget it. Cause like I get off the phone, you know, saying, uh, you know, with, from them asking me to, you know, that I'm going to be playing congas. And now, I called up. You've been, you've been performing with them. I've been performing with them. Yeah. For probably yeah. two years. Okay. So um, you're working, I, you're making a living, you're performing with yeah. them. So, so mm -hmm. you're, they're saying now we need more from you. The answer is always yeah. yes. Right. Yes, exactly. I mean, it was like they handed me a boron and, you know, the Irish frame drum and they handed me the boron and they said, learn, you know, and, uh, and I remember like, you know, being, you know, on the road with them and being in England and Scotland and, you know, hooking up with the boron player and being like just a sponge, like teach me everything, you know, you know, hanging out in the pub until four in the morning, like just studying, learning, practicing, playing, like just a sponge, right? Like it was school all over again. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing, right? And I, you know, get off the phone from the conversation of saying, you know, okay, you're going to play congas and calling up my buddy, Jean Leroy. And like, Jean, I need a lesson right now, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and then going out and like learning. And I mean, like talk about trial by fire. Like I'm learning to play congas on the gig, you mm -hmm. know, and just thrown in the fire and just, you know, just giving it my all every night, constantly practicing, constantly learning. And, and that's how, how that went, you know, and I mean, it was just such an amazing musical experience. It was, you know, learning how to play um, that show was such a high level. And in shows like that, and I don't, people may not know this, but when you get up into shows of this caliber um, that are shows that are, um, 
you know, that are that structured. A lot of those shows, choreographed touring, and you're doing touring. the same show every night. It's uh, yeah. d- picture like a a music a musical or a Broadway yeah. show. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of those shows are played to uh, in ear monitor. You have in ear yes. monitors, like a click. and a lot of times you have a click track yeah. and some sequence. So learning how to play with learning how to play with click and sequence and learning how to play where that time is, but then still learning how to be able to play musically so that you can still give that music the feel that it needs to have Mm -hmm. while you've got this, you know, click track or metronome, you know, going off in your ear. Right. And so learning, learning all of that. But the, the thing about barrage was it was at such a high level. I mean, it was just, you know, they pushed us so hard to just be better and better and better. And, and I'm like, I'll never forget, you know, they'd give me music and I'd be like, I can't play this. Like, I cannot, this is beyond my physical capabilities. Mm -hmm. And Dean would just go, Oh, you'll get it. You'll get it. You know? And there I am like two weeks before the show going, I can't play it. I can't play it. You know? And there I am in the practice room every night, shedding, 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 practicing, 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 momentum, momentum. All of a sudden it's like, break through the wall and all of a sudden what we talked about all of a sudden I figured something out because I had done it for 20 hours, 30 hours. And all of a sudden there it was. And, and all of a and sudden I could do it. I want to you interject. Know? It's not just the 20 or 30 hours you spent working on that. It's the thousands of hours you spent working on every other thing that gives you the experience and the ability to do that in 20 or 30 hours. Exactly. Because otherwise yeah. Forget about it. If, if all yeah. you'd done was play, um, you know, a rock pattern for 10 years in a rock band, that wouldn't prepare you for... Everything you said was about being teachable. The word you said, being a sponge. You know, you're, you're being teachable. You're open. You're listening. You're learning. And you're ready to soak up knowledge from everybody around you. Um, uh-huh. And that's, that's... Man, everything you just said is, I think, the path to being a, a great and successful musician that's mm-hmm. that's the path um, mm-hmm. and and all the while listening creating together with all of those musicians and becoming you know one you know mm-hmm. and and like you know when we do the cj oceans right it's like there's what 17 musicians 20 17 musicians sometimes to 26 depending 26 on, yeah. right yeah. and you know, and all of us are there listening to each other, supporting each other, creating with each other. And there it's, it's that magic that it's like, and then when we're sharing that with a live audience, which, you know, this is why I think we're all missing live music so much is there's something that happens, Yeah. you know, when we share that space together and we live in this world that is, so fast paced, you know, we're here, we're there, we're there, we're on our cell phones, we're here, you know, you know everything is just click, click, go, 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 go. And quick fix. I want something, I get fix. it now. Yes. I want it, order it from Amazon, it's at my house tomorrow. Boom. I want a burger, yeah. I go, I get it, better be fast. Yeah. yeah. And when we're performing a concert, you know, we're performing a, say, a two hour show, and we've got a 45 minute set. For 45 minutes, all of the musicians on stage are engaged, we're focused, we're centered, we're present. Mm-hmm. And the audience is right there with us, sharing that experience for 45 minutes. The 26 musicians on stage, and however many hundreds of people, whatever thousands, whatever in the audience that are there present, we share that experience together. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, what we're so missing and craving as I agree. not only musicians, but people in general, culture, we're all like, we're starved for that, that experience of sharing that, right? And so, you know, it, you and I have been through, we've both, I know, been to thousands of shows and played thousands of shows. And I know what that's done for my soul and, and how that's, 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 that the arts we're talking about, the arts industry has, has, mm. has, uh, I don't know, Jerry Maguire completed me, something like, you know, like that, that there's a, we're, we're talking about a human experience and we're talking about musicians and artists commenting on the human condition. Yeah. Um, and when, you know, the thing that got me over stage fright, 
um, as an introvert that was going to go do this. And, and then I wanted to sing and I wanted to be a front man. And that was not any of that. I, I had to learn all of that and I'm still learning. Um, and the was just, we're just a bunch of people in a room. Like as mm. beautiful as the hall might be, as incredible as the lighting or, or the sound techs are doing incredible things. And you see on the musicians are doing incredible things. There may be dancers, there may be whatever show we're doing. We're just people in a room and let's mm -hmm. enjoy this, this time together. Um, and we have a presentation for you and this is it. And that, that was what really changed me to, um, to be really comfortable on stage, you know, just mm. with that, that whole experience. But, oh man, that's amazing. The, um, and so you toured mm. around the world, uh, full time for how many years playing with Barrage? 10 years. Yeah. So 10 years yeah. touring the world, playing shows, playing huge concert halls and stadiums and dancers and an ever evolving show, uh, mm -hmm. pushing towards excellence at all times. Uh, as best as you could with a group around you and when you become one. And when you said that, uh, the thing that came to my mind for, and, and I can hear it in CJO recordings, like in the Christmas record, um, where the CJO was on my Christmas record, and, and then and, and a lot of moments in Sweet Jubilation. And my phrase is always that the, when a group of musicians moves as one organism, it's not, it, it, we're, we're, you know, like you said, we become one. And for some reason, the word organism just always comes up, but it's just like, we're, we're moving like one unit, one existing thing. Um, and we're in sync for that period of time. Um, I love that. Um, okay. So, and, and so to that, to that end, I think too, that that's why, like when you, when you play with a symphony and there's a hundred musicians, all yep. doing that yeah like that's that power that energy it's like it's yeah it's exactly what you talked about so now there's a hundred people it's overwhelming. as one organism mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and so you know and the more musicians that you have to do that or whatever you then that just keeps multiplying and exactly what you're saying right it's yeah it's um it's it's powerful it's yeah. uh yeah it's been a long time since i played with the the cpo here but the uh but yeah, it was it was always a fascinating experience, and um, mm. you can have that with two musicians, and you can have that in a room where you have ten in the audience, um, and you can have right. that in in where you have thousands in the audience, mm -hmm. and it's all the experiences are different. And you know, one of my favorite places to play in in Calgary is the Blackfoot Inn, and I, it's just a lobby. And, but they have jazz. Mm. They've had jazz every night for 40 years, I think. Every Sorry, every Thursday night for 40 mm -hmm. years or something. And it's only recently in the last few years that I started doing them either with two or, or two uh, with, a, with a piano player or with, with my quartet, with my rhythm section behind me. But uh, it's one of my favorite places to play because, I, and I can't explain why. It's not, you know, you're not on stage. You're not, and of course I love all that too, but um but when it comes up, it's just it's just where I've had some incredible music experiences, and I think it's because mm. we're really free and really. So it doesn't always have to be the big show, right? No, it's, definitely um, not. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what was the first jazz record you heard that made you love that music? Because you're coming from a classical music training kind of a background, studying mm. it, and and <laughs> when. When I was in university and I did like a classical side and then I did a, I did a jazz studies degree, um, but f in my program, you know, where you did your master's, I, um, I did my bachelor's and it was like, they made you do a full classical degree. Um, and then all the jazz study stuff was, was on top. So like mm. they made us do both. Um, and and, and I know definitely being in that program, doing the classical performance stuff, that it was like, that was all they wanted you to focus on. They really didn't want you to listen to, focus on, learn, study other musics, at least the professors I had at that time at that institution. I'm not saying they all are like that. And I don't think most of them these days are. Um, but, but so you're coming from that tradition. And um, so, so what, what was it that made you 
kind of love jazz music and 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 you know what record was it or artist or well it's funny because i'm thinking back to way 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 before that like a little kid growing oh, wow. up okay um i had two records that were like i could not get enough of uh one was goofy greats no i'm just kidding <laughs> i did love goofy greats but <laughs> um, is that a kid's no. record i don't know what that is is that goofy greats yeah oh yeah it was this there, it was one of those k-tel albums <clears throat> that had <laughs> you know like <clears throat> snoopy snoopy and the red bear anyways whatever um but no there was two albums that i list that i could not listen to enough one was an album and i gotta find it because i i i have not seen it or heard it ever since i was a kid it was called drums a go-go and it was all like latin music it was all latin mm -hmm. sort of latin big band kind of like um more like 60s kitsch kind of um that sort of latin kind of you know yeah there 60s. was a different yeah. like you say kitsch vibe in the 60s yeah latin. it was very yeah. popular right it was yes yeah yeah I know what you mean and now. the other one was herb albert tijuana brass oh really yeah <laughs> which is kind of a i don't know if it's a i mean i don't i i hate putting labels on things i don't know if it's a jazz album but it's a it was a great album at the time it sold massive he's a great trumpet player right yeah and so that was like as a kid. So then growing up, like, I mean, I was always that weird kid, like, you know, that, uh, that would go out and buy like Michael Jackson thriller and Metallica on the same day. You know, I grew up in a small town and it was like, you know, you had either like Stetler, it was like, you were either listened to country music or heavy metal. So I was metal. <laughs> like I loved, you know, metal. Um, right. and then when I started taking drum lessons, um, uh, my drum teacher laid on me, uh, Buddy Rich and Pete Escovito. So you may have heard of Sheila E. Yeah. yeah. Um, the famous percussionist, her yeah, father amazing. was Pete Escovito. Oh, okay. And, and so it was, it was all Latin stuff. So that was sort of that Latin jazz. So I was exposed to Latin jazz well before I was exposed to the more like, uh, other styles of jazz. And I don't think. I don't think I actually heard like, like, I know that the first time I heard like more of, you know, the, I guess what we would call jazz or whatever, I would have been first year university and, um, and my buddy, you know, played Miles Davis for me because I had not heard Miles Davis until I was in university first year. Mm -hmm. And it would just, you know, I was just like, what is this? Like, you know, I'll never forget the first time I heard, you know, Miles, what, what Miles Davis. What it was, um, uh, oh gosh, of course, the name is a scheme of His most famous kind selling album. Kind of, thank you. Yeah. yeah. It was kind of blue. And um, yeah, and it was just it, just, it just floored me. You know, it was just like, wow, what is this? And from there, I went right down the rabbit hole and, you know, Miles Davis, Coltrane, like, especially Buddy Rich, of course, being a drummer. So any of the drummers, right? Like I just, you know, went, went off um, down, down that, that rabbit hole, right? And then, um, and then, like musicians, we just explore. We just because people mm -hmm. say, "Well, what should I listen to?" And I'm like, "What do you like? You know, what have you heard that you like? Is there any mm -hmm. artist you 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 know?" And and they're like, "I want to learn more about jazz." Well, what what jazz? Or have you heard an, a title of a jazz record? You know, because you know, I need a bit of a direction. So, like, have you check out Kind of Blue? And mm -hmm. like it, don't like it, doesn't matter. But give me your opinion, and you give me your opinion. Now we can now we can find you something. Mm -hmm. that, for me, the first time I heard Kind of Blue, I think I said this once and already in one of these sessions, but I, I didn't get it. I was in high school. I, uh, I loved big band. And that was uh -huh. how I came into it. And I loved Louis Armstrong. And so Kind of Blue was just too, I didn't get it. And uh, I liked vocals, right? I loved hearing right. singing and stuff. So there was no, and I'm like, well, there's no screaming trumpets in the big band. There's no lead trumpet mm -hmm. player. And there's no, and then I came back to it a couple of years later and went, oh my goodness, this is, I get it now. You know, I needed, my ears needed to grow and my understanding mm -hmm. needed to grow. And then my soul was fed more, right? Yeah. And you don't need to be studying music to do that, right? Well, you know, and exactly. And like, and growing up too, I mean, you know, like listening to, you know, like you said, like Louis Armstrong or, or any of that stuff with the vocals, mm -hmm. I've been listening to that kind of stuff. Anything that was like that kind of stuff or musical or like any of the, anything that was more with a ton of vocals that had swing beat behind it. I've been listening to that without even really knowing that it was jazz. Like it, to me, right. that was just like, like show music. That's right. And music. I had been listening. Yeah. This is music. 
you know, it's just music. Yeah. Which is which is and, how Allington talked about it, and how most people it's just music. labels are are great. They're fine. I, I have nothing really against them. Um, we talk about what do you like metal? At least you know it, it puts you in a direction, but um, mm. but it's mm-hmm. not the same as really immersing yourself in in jazz music and and learning what that is that umbrella, and why it's so hard to. That's another controversial. Well, what is what is and what isn't jazz? Oh yes. Um, uh, no, thank you. Uh, mm. Let's just go play. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, you, have, you know the you know the old joke, right? You know, play play a wrong note wrong note once, it's a mistake. Play it twice, it's jazz. Oh, <laughs> oh, ouch. Um, the uh, so since playing with the Calgary Jazz Orchestra, because we don't have percussion all the time, but but um, what uh, what has been your favorite uh, show to play, or do you have any stories or or anything that that comes to mind? Uh, um, uh, you know, gosh, we're we're about to start our. Mm. I, I think you were still out of town touring at the beginning, and I'm not sure now. But but we're about to start our. We're into our 17th year in uh, October, yeah. which is kind of kind of blows my mind. We were doing a mm. live stream last night, and and the 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 MC musician that was running at Alistair he came over and said, "How long has it been? Like, is it 10 years now?" And I'm like, "Oh my gosh, no! I'm just getting really old." Um, but, uh, but yeah, do you have anything that comes to mind? Any stories or anything? Um, yeah, you know, I think it was actually the first, the first, uh, art, would it be the art of romance or the first soul, soul gospel show? It was like Valentine's, it was Valentine's Day show. Mm -hmm. And it was my first gig with you. And, um, and of course I was nervous. Um, I hadn't, I hadn't played with you before. So I was nervous. I wanted to. So you I heard all to, the stories about how brutal I am to musicians. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, um, and right away from from that process, you know, from the first rehearsal when we get into the first rehearsal, and it was just so much joy, and everybody's mm. laughing, and everybody's joking, and and it was just like so much fun. I mean, good lord, with like with Jim and and Cody, like I mean, come on, right? Like it's just. It's just nonstop, right? And um, and so so that right away, just immediately, that those nerves, that that um, that perfectionism that we talked about, that need to to do a good job, um, just kind of melts away because it's like hmm. we're just we're here to have fun. We're going to play music. We're going to be very serious about what we're doing from. A, a, a professional standpoint, mm-hmm. but we're going to have fun. And, mm-hmm. and I'll just never forget it, you know, and uh, we get into the second half and it was all that soul gospel stuff. And I don't know if you know, knew this, but I changed my shoes to my gold disco boots pretty much <laughs> and wore my gold boots for the second half of the soul show <laughs> and was just a dancing fool. I was up there playing tambourine and dancing around and just, having the time of my life. And I remember after the show, a couple people commented on me. They're like, you look like you were having so much fun. And I was like, guilty as charged. Like, you know, it just, it was just so much joy and fun. And just that, what we talked about that, where you just let it all go and you just become a vessel for the music Mm -hmm. and you just, you just let it shine through you. And you, you're not thinking about what you, you are thinking, but you're not like, it's like, I don't know. It's just all gone. And you're just, you're just there being, doing, creating, and yeah. you're, you know, you're a vessel, you know? I think, and I it think was, that's mastery. Yeah. That, that's mm-hmm. a, that's a mastery and effortless moment. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Miles Davis said, man, learn everything. I, I do a very bad Miles Davis impersonation. <laughs> I, there, there's actually recordings of him saying this on YouTube. So people check it out. Cause it's, it's profound hearing it from miles but he said something to the effect of learn everything and then just forget it and play mm-hmm. learn everything yeah. and just forget it and play mm-hmm. and you know um uh with my my martial arts fascination and bruce lee talks about um with uh, his, his approach to jeet kundo he's like you know the traditional forms he's like they're, they're too slow they hold you down but how do you learn to well you learn all the traditional forms and then you learn to just improvise and yeah. just react yeah. and just yeah. be you know, it, it becomes uh, a flow or a, a, a bounce that it's just, it flows. And mm-hmm. anytime I've kind of touched something where I feel effortless doing in, in other things I've studied and other things I like to do, um, 
that's the feeling that's going on, right? But um, and anyway, it's it's funny you say that because see, to me, the reason I I wanted to foster that we're here for a reason. We're here to play. We're here, but let's have a ton of fun because the, if mm. this should be fun, um, we should have joy in doing this, not um, not fear. And uh, I don't know about you um, or or a lot of you know people who study music, but the that wasn't something that was ever taught. And and I remember once playing a lead trumpet for mm. the university group, and we're touring, and the the director had like we, had, we some of these like two or three shows a day, and I was I, had, I was doing solos. I was overblowing like I was like we talked before. I was using too much. Um, hitting too hard mm -hmm. like I was, I, was, mm -hmm. I was and then I'm hitting you know I had to hit all these high notes I had to play lead trumpet I had to and they were beyond my ability now I could hit the notes in a practice room but to do it musically in a group in real mm -hmm. time it was beyond my ability and uh, uh, now I, I could say those things I'm like I'd look at it and go that's that's beyond where I'm at right now but if I'm gonna do this give me a, a few months to work it up or something you know but um mm -hmm. And, uh, and I missed a note and it was at a, a high school show and he, and then he turned onto the microphone and he goes, well, there was supposed to be a really high note at the end there, but apparently our lead trumpet player didn't practice enough. And it had nothing to do with practicing enough. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And this is a, this is a very extreme example, but, um, uh, and he would make fun of me in rehearsals if I would miss high notes. You know, there was one, one chart we were playing, I think it was like 52 uh, high Fs or something I had to play and I hit a bunch of them and uh, um, but I miss some and he would make fun of me in rehearsals and that's that that what does that make us do like especially when you're you know, almost 17 or 18 or something right it just makes you just oh shoot I saw oh, yeah. I need to practice more and then you just <clears throat> go and then you practice more to the point that I'd over practice and injure myself and yeah. then have a harder time playing and think that I just am doing something wrong I suck maybe I'm just not cut out for this you know, the other mm -hmm. people are not me. And sin and I'm sharing this because I've heard this, this similar type of feeling from almost everybody that I've worked with, that I've talked to, that's doing something artistic or something with expression or something, you know, where they're learning an instrument. Um, so for me, it was always important to, to allow us to just explore and learn together and make mistakes together but then grow together and, and get better. You know, that was mm -hmm. maybe because that's just what I needed. So maybe it was totally selfish. That's where I'd feel comfortable. But <laughs> but I think we were all kind of coming from that, you know, uh, to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think you're really touching on something there because as, you know, as musicians and performers and um, I know that like we're, this whole thing that we're talking about, about how, you know, we can be very hard on ourselves. I know I'm, I, I'm my own worst enemy, you know, um, I can just literally um, beat myself up endlessly for the mistakes I made, you know, um, <clears throat> to the point where it's like in the show, I played 96% of the show really well. Mm -hmm. And I'll beat myself up for that 4%, mm -hmm. right? Because of these things that we've been, for whatever reason, like you were saying, we, we somehow have learned those things that those mistakes aren't acceptable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's like, we're humans, you know, we're, we're not machines. If we were machines, we would just let the computer play the music. It would sound but, like that too. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And, and so that's something that I, I always have to remind myself and continually, you know, continually work on you know, to accept those mistakes because they're going to happen, you know, and, and that's, you know, the one thing like, I guess if there's, you know, young musicians or anybody out there that's listening to this, it's like the second you make a mistake, it's done. It's out there. It's gone. Like you have to let it go mm -hmm. because the second you think about that mistake, then all of a sudden you're not present and while you're, you're thinking about the mistake mm -hmm. while you're performing. And then guess what? You play another mistake and then Absolutely. you're like, Oh no, I just made another mistake. And then, Boom, 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 right? Yeah. It's like mistakes out there. It's done. It's gone. And you have to try to let it just go and continue to, to, to remain focused and present. And, and that's, I think, 
probably every musician would say easier said than done, yeah. but it is something <laughs> that it is something that I think we, it's like, like we have to practice. I think we have to practice that too. Absolutely. We're practicing focus. We're pra and because I know uh, this is the, this is the balance is if it's an alive performance or it's in a rehearsal or it's in practicing, you know, when you're practicing, you can stop and go, and I, this is something I try to get my students mm. to go, instead of beating yourself up, go, okay, well, why did I play that right nine times and not this last time? Mm. Why did the note not come out? Why was it out of tune? Why did it not have good tone? Um, for, for me in, in teaching trumpet and voice, it's usually because there's something fundamentally wrong in your technique that you forgot about. And when you're in the practice room, uh -huh. you can do that. When you're on the stage, if that happens, I just treat it as a reminder to get back to fundamentals. Like we talked about making sure your mm -hmm. technique, your posture, your breathing, your stance, your, your, your strike or your, your embouchure and your articulation is correct. And then go back to focusing on the music, mm -hmm. just reset. Mm -hmm. And then, and then mm -hmm. because we're human, like it's, 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 right. it's yeah. going to happen, but, yeah. but you, you, you remember those things so you can get better, but you don't beat yourself up over it. That's yeah. yeah. Cause it's, yeah. um, I've even heard Wynton Marsalis play a wrong note once. <coughs> and and uh, uh, it's probably the only one he's done in the last 40 years, but, but I, I did hear it. So um, uh, I, I, I once uh, saw a live performance of Stevie Wonder and he made a mistake and, and he made the mistake and he just put his head back and laughed. And, yeah. and I was like, see, like even Stevie makes mistakes, right? Like, yeah. you know, it's like, see, we're, yeah, exactly. I mean, we're all, we're all human. Nobody's, nobody's perfect. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want to go back cause you asked me uh, about stories and, and funny things. So uh, back to the very first concert that I played with you. And um, you, you mentioned these little things back here and how much, <laughs> you know, wind chimes, you know, and I don't know if you remember this, but there was something that happened in the concert and, and I, and I played, you know, I played musically speaking, like in the music. Yeah. Yes. Well, I can't even remember how it came about. It might've been when you were like talking okay. and you were like telling some story and in the middle of the story, like I played the wind chimes cause it just fit with your story <laughs> and you stopped dead and you turned around and you said, Hey Bob, what did I tell you? How much? What did I tell you about what I think about wind chimes? <laughs> and, and my comment was, "How much you love them, John?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that totally and, sounds like something I'd do. And, <laughs> and I'm thinking, this is my first gig, and as I'm as I do this, I'm like, I'm never hired again. <laughs> <laughs> and the and the whole band was howling. The audience oh, yeah. was howling. It was like, yeah. Oh man. Oh, that, that's. Uh, <laughs> I I remember that now. It's it's coming back, and that a hundred percent sounds like something I do because um, <sighs> I would be in the middle of telling a story and hear that, and instead of just ignoring it, or instead of I, I'd be, <laughs> I'd go. No, now we're talking about that. Now we're talking about the chimes. <laughs> exactly. I'll come back to my story. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it was, oh, it was, it was, it was one of those golden live moments that oh, God. just, <laughs> and just have some oh. fun. The, you know, I can tell you, um, after that, I remember after that we were, I was, I was on tours. I, I can't remember where we were. I, I don't remember where we were, but I was with Igor and we had, uh, he was with me and, uh, we we're doing a quintet thing with, um, I think we were in Japan, but there was a, uh, bass player and a drummer and. Anyway, um, all I remember is uh, we were doing some, we were doing jazz. There was a grand piano and he had a keyboard. And in the middle of talking, he, he was, was, had a patch with chimes. And he was like playing a chime patch. And then he, would, he was doing it to bug me. And it was right after that. I, I don't remember <laughs> where, but it was right after that. And he was doing it just to bug me, right? Like, uh, and it was, it, and, and of course, I, I'm... It, it could have been while I was talking. I just remember just just completely going off the rails. Like I got to focus now. Really. Oh god! Oh, good times. The um, good times. Okay, what what other interests do you have uh, outside of music? Just just quickly. 
uh, that you absolutely absolutely geek out over? What are you into? Mountain biking, yeah, cycling, cool. yeah, yeah, love it. Um, and snowboarding, winter time, yeah, just can't get enough of it. Um, and uh, and my new latest thing at, in, at home here is uh, one of the gifts of COVID is I created a uh, live plant to d- a, a fish aquarium. And I have like 35 fish in it wow. and all these live plants. And uh, I've never been a green thumb. I've never been able to grow plants. And this aquarium is just something that uh, just brings me so much joy to have this ecosystem in my house. And it's, um, that's really, really beautiful. Oh, that's really cool. I, yeah. Um, when uh, I, I have a koi pond out back. Oh, I nice. thought I'd... Yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen them, but there's there's thirty yeah. ish koi. I have not. Um, I mean, I've seen your big. pond, but not yeah. with the yeah. Okay. Yeah. The um the and and I'm I'm amazed at how much I like it. But I didn't know you mountain bike. I'm just getting back into it, so we'll have to go for a ride. <clears throat> um, Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Let's go for a ride. Yeah, yeah. that'd be fun. Um, there's a couple comments here. Uh, absolutely, write comments in on the Facebook thing, and and um, uh, John said. Uh, Wow, guys, part of this, this part of the, about the interview about fun and mistakes is really important. Thank you. Um, I'm glad, I'm glad you got something out of that, John. Um, mm. and, and honestly, like, I, I don't want to sound like Confucius here, but I think that, that, that to me, that's applied to everything I've ever done or everything I've ever learned. Like, uh, it's, yeah, it's important to have fun. It's important to be serious and have fun. I, I heard this phrase once that I really liked. Um, I don't think I created it. I, I'm going to take, I'm going to take credit for it. Um, um, but I don't know if I created this. I don't know if I heard this, you know, but I've just had this in my head for so long, which was, uh, I take what I do very seriously. I just don't take myself that seriously. Yes. Um, and that Amen. helped me really figure out that balance, you know, between, mm-hmm. between pure joy mm-hmm. and fun and grace, um, and, and skill and mm-hmm. training and truth mm-hmm. and, and training that, that, that truth, grace balances. I think it's a difficult one. Um, yeah, that's uh, well said. Um, I think uh, <clears throat> that what you said has also been known as what's called Rule 42, which is... The meaning of life? No, Rule 42 oh. <laughs> was uh, take yourself, take what you do seriously, but don't take yourself so seriously. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. And uh, John said, uh, awesome tambourine. Uh, oh, I'm doing a, an arrangement for a group that John leads, I think, and that you play in. And uh, um, I'm, I, it's that's next on my docket. John's probably going to ask that question next, but that's next yeah. on my docket is to finish that. Okay. I've been doing a lot of writing for uh, when when things were really busy. I couldn't really do writing for other people, and and things mm-hmm. of course are calmer because of of the lockdowns. So I, I've been able to to do writing for other people, and it's really fun. Um, so I'll be writing for you okay. for uh, for the street band that you uh, yeah. play in yeah the party band so so i'm gonna back up one second mm-hmm. I, I like it's rule 62 not 42 rule 62, 62. yeah oh, good because okay. some fact yeah. checker was going to send me an email i know right because uh, the light the answer to life the universe and everything is it's 42 it's 42 yes 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 um, thanks yeah. to the so yes and, yes and now back to what we were talking about um the 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 group i think you're talking about is the delirium street party brass that's right yeah yeah yeah. Um, and uh, Wes Schellenberg says, agreed, good reminders. Thank you, Wes. Um, yeah. And this is good, too. I like uh, John said, Bobby Shue encouraged us. I, I got to study a lot with Bobby Shue, and I actually, I, I really uh-huh. want to Skype him again because he's, I just saw that he played with Blue Mitchell in a trumpet section, and I'm like, seriously? And now I just want to Skype <laughs> him and talk to him about Blue Mitchell. But um, uh, uh, Bobby Shue, if anyone doesn't know, is just an incredible musician that had an incredible mm-hmm. career as a studio trumpet player and, and played with Maynard mm. and played with, I'm pretty sure, yeah, he played with Buddy Rich. And um, I remember talking with uh, Tony Scodwell, um, who builds trumpets now. He built, I have one of his horns, but um, lives in Vegas and he's retired, but he was uh, played with Kenton forever. And it's, he said, oh yeah, Bobby Shue got me the gig with Kenton. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, that is, that is amazing. Yeah. Um, but uh, he, I, I like this. He said, Bobby Shue encouraged us uh, to use the word sincere rather than serious. And I like that. That's good. Oh, nice. <laughs> good. Yeah. Um, Excellent. And uh, Norm says, it's been a great learning wow. experience. Thanks, Norm. I appreciate oh, it. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, so the, uh, the, what do I have for you here? We, uh, 
we're, we're doing a terrible job of keeping this to an hour because we're coming up to two hours here. <clears throat> wow, really? Stop wow. being so oh, interesting. Um, <laughs> okay, so so we're just gonna do. Uh, I'm just gonna okay. rapid fire questions for you. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, are you ready? <sighs> okay. Okay. Uh, mm. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Yes. All right. What is the weirdest thing you've ever eaten? Speaking of hot dogs. <laughs> oh, God. Um, duck's tongue. Duck tongue. Where was duck's that? Duck's tongue. Uh, in China. Okay. And and it was a delicacy when we were in China on tour with Barrage. And so they kept feeding us all these delicacies. And I, I, I tried everything. Why not? It's like, okay. You know, and some of it was like disgusting. Some of it was surprisingly tasty. The duck's tongue. I could not get it down. I would swallow it and it would just come right back up and come right back up. And I tried four times to swallow this thing and I could not swallow it. It just kept coming back up. And so eventually I just like kind of had to spit it out into my napkin and the host, they all laughed and <laughs> more for us. And then they, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there's, I have a, I have a friend who said, uh, she, um, she's Canadian and then she, um, met her husband when she was living in and working in Japan and they had a I think it was their engagement party and they they order this uh, all this food and they bring it all in and uh, it's fresh from you know caught that day kind of thing in the ocean mm -hmm. and so they're all they're eating all this great food and a plate of live eels uh, gets put oh, in front wow. and and they say well you know yeah you know and you have to eat it and it's rude to you know and so, so she grabs this live eel and bites it, and it, she, I think she said it was like lead and lead tasty and slippery and and, and just, <sighs> and they all burst out laughing. They're like, "We don't eat those." <laughs> and she married them, and they're and they're a lovely couple. I love those two, but I love her story about that. Awesome. I'm probably forgetting some details, but mm. you reminded me of that. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. What is the world's most overrated instrument? Overrated instrument? Overrated. Mm. <laughs> oh, God. Like electric guitar? Ah, okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> who, who was the worst teacher? Now, you don't have to say a name, but who was the okay. worst teacher you ever had and why? Oh, wow. Uh, we had a band teacher in grade three who did not know how to teach us anything. He just tried to, he just, the louder we played, the louder he yelled. <laughs> <laughs> it's not how it's done, sir. No. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to try that at the next CJO uh, rehearsal you're at. Um, who was the most, uh, who is the most interesting person you've ever met? Oh, wow. Hmm. That's a tough one. Uh, it is. You know, off the top of my head, because it's the one that's coming to mind, yeah. is um, Royale Wooten, Future Man, from uh, Beta Fleck and Flectons. Yeah. 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 We, had a, we had a really interesting night one night when uh, we were on tour with Barrage and, and Bela Fleck and the Flectones were on tour and um, we'd been piggybacking night after night after night and we were in Scranton, Pennsylvania and it just happened to be that uh, we had a night off and they were playing and we were all staying in the same hotel and, um, and we ended up getting to go to the show and we got to meet Victor Wooten and Bela Fleck and Royal Wooten and uh, forgetting the saxophone player's name right now. Um, anyways, um, we got to hang out with him and I got to hang out with Royal Wooten and we just, we went off about math and music and the universe and like the infinity series and like all things math. Cause I was told, I'm totally into how math can explain everything in the universe. And so you can apply different mathematical properties. Um, so music is math and all of the overtone series are, it's all math. So he was telling me about how he was creating these instruments and applying different mathematical properties to, um, to this instrument that he created. 
and creating new sound that had never been heard before based on these different mathematical properties. And he said, some of them created beautiful things. And he said, some of these mathematical properties created things that just sounded wrong. That's how he, how he explained it. But yeah, I was, that was, wow. that was a very interesting night. Yeah. No. Oh, wow. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, on a very, very different than that last question, who is the superhero that you are most like? <laughs> Super Grover. <laughs> Super Grover. <clears throat> okay, that's uh, okay. Um, excellent. Uh, who is a musician uh, that you would love to play with of all time? Of all time? Uh, J.S. Bach. Wow. Right? Hmm. Wow. Okay. What does a perfect day look like? Hmm. Some playing, uh, being somewhere uh, with my friends, um, probably outside somewhere because I love being out in nature. I love being away from the hustle and bustle of the city. So maybe somewhere out in Mother Nature, whether it's in the mountains or by the ocean. Um, and, you know, perhaps by the end of the uh, hanging out with friends, doing, playing some games, sharing some stories making a bunch of good food together and then playing music, perhaps maybe having a nice bonfire and jamming around the fire, playing some music, something like that, maybe. Uh, and maybe that's mixed in with that's the day off in the middle of a tour, a musical tour. <laughs> huh? Yeah. 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 Um, hmm. Very cool. I love it. Um, now this is something I, I love to ask musicians. What do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, well, do I have to grow up? No, you don't at all. Um, yeah. What what are, off the top of your head, as quickly as possible, what are five awkward ways to answer? How's it going? <laughs> five awkward ways? Uh, I don't know. How that's, I don't know how to answer this. <laughs> well, that, that, that would be that would be, that one. would be one how's it going okay. i don't know how to answer this that's one <laughs> that's pretty uh, awkward yeah it's pretty awkward um maybe just scream it's scream back that, at them yeah. <laughs> you know um i'm gonna get you know. to re i'm gonna get you to reenact <laughs> this uh you know, some, at a rehearsal sometime or something, you know, I'll, I'll have, I'd, I'd love to see you scream at Jeremy Brown when he asks you how you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just scream. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Th yeah. That would be awkward. Yeah. Okay. Well, those are, mm -hmm. those are good. Okay. Um, which yeah. uh, Jeremy Brown, I think is, uh, is, is uh, my guest next week. Oh, nice. Awesome. Um, awesome. I'll tell him you said uh, scream. Uh, yes, yeah. Okay, and lastly, how would you explain your job as a percussionist without using any musical terms or any instrument names? What is it do you, that you do? I take the listener on a journey by painting with texture and color to evoke emotions and try to take you on a journey that gets you to connect with your soul by using these colors and, and textures <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome that's very deep i was expecting like i hit things with my hand mm. <laughs> i i i have i have said that that i 
that I, yeah, I hit things for a living. I mean, so, that's, that's cathartic. Mm, hit, um, hit and shake. A lot of shaking. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> whole lot of shaking going on. Hey. Um, well, that's awesome. Bob, thank you so much for coming and hanging out with me tonight on this. And, um, I have a feeling we could talk for hours and hours and hours about more. Yeah, dude. You know, there's one thing you mentioned too that I'll say. Uh, you said it earlier, and you said it there too. You paint, you paint pictures, and I I talk so mm. much about uh, my focus on uh, on arranging and orchestrating. I, I talk about colors, and I talk when I'm trying to explain it to people. I say I'm trying to. They go, especially if someone say, "Well, what do you mean you're still studying this?" And I'm like, "Well, there's so much to learn." And, and it's, I'm trying to add new colors to my palette so that mm. when I need that color, I can just do it and it has the, the desired effect. And sometimes mm. when an arrangement or an orchestration takes me longer, it's because I hear that color, um, that, that whatever I'm after. But I, I don't really know what it is I'm hearing or how to re recreate it or how to mm. write it so that the band can recreate it, the orchestra can recreate it. Um, but so I, I've always loved that idea of um, studying colors and thinking of everything we do in colors, uh, because it it's like a it's a visual representation I think that everyone can understand. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But thank you so much for joining yeah. me tonight, man. Awesome, um, Johnny. I love you, Bob, and it's just a pleasure to chat with you and hang with you as always. And um, yeah, likewise, Johnny. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm honored. For, uh, oh, sorry. I said I was just gonna say I'm honored to to be a part of this and. Uh, and I can't, I can't wait to get back to uh, creating some of that painting, uh, colors and sounds with uh, with you and your band, and and um, yeah. So, thanks, thanks for this. Yeah, yeah, it's me been too, really man. great. Yeah, um, the break is was was uh, I'm sure good for us for a lot of reasons, but uh, definitely mm. ready to get back at it. And uh, thank you for everyone for listening. Um, yes. And, Thank uh, you, Bob, everyone. Are you, are you teaching private lessons? That's my last question. If someone wants private lessons, yes, yes, yes I'm available. So yeah, get a hold mm -hmm. of Bob, or, or you can uh, email, um, or just go to the uh, Calgary Jazz Orchestra website and just email the CJO. They'll give you Bob's mm -hmm. email, um, or get in touch with him on social media, and mm -hmm. uh, or write me here, and I'll get you in touch with Bob. And uh, you can take some lessons over Zoom or over or in person if you're in Calgary. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening tonight. And uh, have a great day. And we'll see you yeah. soon. Bye, yeah. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, buddy. Awesome. <laughs>